Psalm 100, verse 5, reminds us that the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever. Amen? Amen. Well, today we continue with our denomination-wide 40 days of prayer, really a, a worldwide Christian and missionary alliance emphasis on reawakening to Christ. We've heard how we need to reawaken to the glory of Christ. Pastor Will shared that a few weeks ago. Uh, then Pastor Roy shared with us how we need to reawaken to the life death and resurrection of Christ, and last week to the Spirit of Christ, which brings us to today where we will look at and implore the Holy Spirit to reawaken us to the church of Christ. So let's start right off the bat with some congregational participation. Complete this sentence for me, please, out loud and together. The church is not... Up. A building, right? Let's write, say it again together. The church is not a building, right? Congratulations, you all win a new car. <laughs> uh, yeah, when the pandemic hit in 2020, uh, we all needed a reminder that the church is not a building, but a people. And while we turned on a dime, we brought church, uh, our worship services online so that we could in some way connect with God as a people, even without a building. We brought Sunday school classes and community groups online so we could connect together as God's people. Even now, we continue to stress that, that Sunday church is not enough. It's vitally important. And in many, many ways, our weekly worship services are the engine that drives the church. But we need so much more than a Sunday morning gathering. Uh, we need what Pastor Brandt likes to call small togetherness, where we, we can be an Acts 6 people, a people who absolutely gathers in the temple for large group or corporate worship of God, but also gathers in homes and small groups to experience um, the church in different and equally meaningful and necessary ways. Acts 6, write it down. We should know how the early Christian church worshiped. The church is not a building. The church is a people bound to one another through the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross, dying for our sins that we may experience what we sang just a few songs back, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Well, today we are going to assume that you know all of that, okay? Yes, the church is a, is a people. It's not a building, and we're going to begin to answer the question, now what? Church is a building, not a people. Now what? What exactly are we being called to reawaken to? I mean, there are all sorts of uh, like-minded people in this world, and thanks to the internet, I don't even have to go to a sci-fi convention to hang out with my fellow Star Wars nerds Whatever it is for you, your mom's group, your exercise group, your sports teams, your political party, your national identity, your favorite university, none of these boast the eternal significance, as does your affiliation, your membership in the church of Jesus Christ on this earth, which is forever. So today we'll dig deeper and answer the question, now what? As we seek to be reawakened to the church of Christ. And we'll do that by visiting the book of Matthew. If you have your Bible with you or a Bible app, please join me in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. We find Jesus, 16, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. We find Jesus beginning a journey to Jerusalem from the area of Caesarea Philippi, a lush area near the foot of Mount Hermon. Caesarea Philippi was a city dominated by pagan worship, and in particular, the worship of the Greek god Pan, 
with, with temples and shrines all around the area. And what's more, the pagan worshipers of that time believed that their fertility gods lived in the underworld and returned to earth each spring and that at a particular cave right there in Caesarea Philippi was literally the gateway to the underworld, the actual gates of hell. And each year, the people of Caesarea Philippi would make sacrifices and engage in grotesque sexual practices in order to worship and to summon their gods. So now, against this backdrop, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do, the, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because the flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father God Almighty, we worship your glorious name. Let your Holy Spirit work within us today as we seek to know you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you be seated? Well, if there's one thing that all good Christians can agree on, it's that Sean Connery is the best and will always be the best, James Bond. Can I get an amen? Yes, someone said Roger Moore this morning. I thought that was ridiculous. It was Susan. I love a good spy movie or a good Tom Clancy novel with Jack Ryan, the CIA agent in a foreign country being chased by the bad guys. And when all their plans go south and they can't make it back across the border, where do they head? To the embassy. They go to the embassy. So what is an embassy? An embassy is a group of government officials who represent their government in a foreign country. My brother-in-law just retired from the Navy, and he and my sister recently moved to Saudi Arabia. And although they work and live among the Saudi people, there is an American embassy planted there so they can engage with a representative from the United States. This is one of our embassies in Saudi Arabia. You may know the name Tony Evans. Tony Evans is a well-known preacher and author. He once said, God has an embassy in history. It's called the church. The church is God's embassy to bring the values of the homeland into foreign territory. The church is not to represent the country that it's in. It's to represent the country it's from. And so to fully understand the church, to reawaken to the church as this embassy, there are several things that our text reminds us of. And the first thing we must do is remember the church's rightful owner. Remember who owns the church. Who is the church an embassy of? And if your mind, you just hit the buzzer and said, it's Jesus, who is, or who is God? Ding, 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 you're correct. You went and set a pot of some pans or something. Craig, I think I, I think I know that. I think I know that. But in the Bible, doesn't it say that Jesus will build his rock, that, that Jesus will build his church on Peter, the rock? Didn't you just read that? Well, let's see together. So here is Jesus amid shrines and temples of gods, worship throughout that region. And he asks the question, who do people say the son of man is? 
Now, the disciples would certainly have recognized this phrase, the Son of Man, because it appears throughout the Torah over a hundred times. Uh, they would have remembered from the book of, of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13, as Daniel prophesies, I continued watching in the night visions, and suddenly one like a Son of Man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His dominion, meaning the Son of Man, uh, that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So when Jesus asks who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples absolutely know what he's referring to. And some say, and, and, and they reply to Jesus, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And so Jesus asks, well, who do you say I am? Peter answers, you are the Messiah the son of the living God. So Jesus comes back to him and he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. Now, don't let's, let's not gloss over this. Jesus is, th this little part right here, Jesus is not affirming the smarts or, or the skillful deduction of Simon, son of Jonah. Rather, he is affirming that this understanding of who Jesus is is a work of God in the mind of Peter, not the work of man. Jesus is not burying the lead here. He's giving us the main idea right up front that he is God, that he is the promised Christ. This is the foundational principle upon which uh, of, of, of everything that Jesus will ever do and ever say throughout his earthly ministry. And if the disciples don't get this right, if we don't get this right, if the church doesn't get this right, then everything we do, Everything we say, all the good deeds that we do uh, as people or the church will be utterly distorted if it is not built on this central bedrock of Jesus teaching about who he is. Now, Jesus continues speaking to Simon, son of Jonah. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Remember how they're standing in the place where the people actually think that's the gates of hell? How cool is that? How cool is that? Uh, I'm a big grammar nerd. I'm a big nerd. Uh, <laughs> uh, Star Wars, grammar, Lord of the Rings. I like things with swords. Uh, I'm a big grammar nerd also, and I love how words interact with one another. So for me, here's the fun part. And it's also the part where, where, we, can, where we can get fairly confused. And it's easy to misinterpret the scripture, and many have over 2,000 years. Another bit of congregational participation here. You probably know this. The name Peter means what? Rock. Rock. Yes, you win a new sofa. I'm giving it all away today, aren't I? Therefore, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, your name is now Peter, and you are the rock upon which I will build my church, right? Not really. Not really. Fortunately, our text from Matthew is clear. Unfortunately, we need to know a little Greek. Fortunately, there's Google. I no speak no Greek. <laughs> You see, Jesus does a little bit of wordplay here. In the original Greek, in which the Gospel of Matthew was written, Jesus says, Simon, you are Petros. And on this Petra, I will build my church. Two different words, two different meanings. Very different meanings. Jesus does not say, you are Petros and on you I will build my church. Nor does he say, you are Petros and on this Petros I will build my church. Jesus says, on this Petra I will build my church. So yes, he does call Simon rock, Peter, Petros, a stone, a rock, 
but Petra, the word Jesus carefully chooses to say that he will build his church on, this means something different entirely. Petra is not a stone. It's bedrock stone. In Matthew 7, when Jesus says that everyone who hears his words and does them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock, he uses the word Petra, not Petros. Petra is the kind of stone where we read in Matthew 27 that that Jesus' tomb was cut out of. Petra is solid. Petra is permanent. Petra is immovable. And that's what Jesus is getting at. What Jesus is getting at is not to name Peter the first pope and that the church will be built on him. No, Jesus is saying, yes, he himself is the Messiah, the son of the living God, the son of God and son of man, the Christ, and this and nothing else is the Petra on which the church of Jesus Christ will be and must be built. Remember the church's rightful owner. You could probably think of churches and pastors who have gotten this wrong over the years, whether intentionally or unintentionally by a slow drip, 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 drip. When we put the church on the back of Peter, When we put the church on the back of us, when we make the church about a dynamic speaker, great music, a comprehensive children's program, good deeds or pro tips for good living, and not on the Petra, the bedrock of the person of Jesus Christ, we've misunderstood the church's rightful foundation. This is so important. Point one, remember the church's rightful owner, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, more participation. Say this with me. Our Father who art in heaven, you know this, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, if we are truly to reawaken to the church of Christ, we must point to remember the church's rightful place. We must remember where we must remember where the church is planted and why God placed it there. As you probably know, the Morgantown Pittsburgh area holds the distinction of having the least amount of the least number of sunny days the least amount of sunshine in the whole country. Well, don't hate us, but last week, Lindsay and I took the kids to sunny Miami. We needed the sun. We all do, don't we? But it could be worse than living in Morgantown. We love living in Morgantown, but it could be worse sunshine-wise, right? There's a small town in Norway called Rukon. There's a J in there, but I think you don't do it. Anybody speak? No. Rukon. There's a small town in Norway called Rukon, tucked away in a narrow valley, and it never gets direct sunlight in the winter. In fact, for six months, beginning in October, Rukon is completely in the shadows due to the sun never reaching over the mountain range. So what did they do? Well, they didn't all go to Miami. Uh, they, but what they did do is they constructed these gigantic mirrors. Check them out. They constructed gigantic mirrors on the top of the mountain overlooking the city and angled to reflect the sunlight into the town square. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that cool? I see my wife marking that on her summer, on my summer honeydew list. I'm not going to get that done. (laughs) Plain and simple. The church of Jesus Christ reflects the kingdom of heaven on earth. And just like the mirrors that reflect the sunshine to the dark town of Rukon, so must we, the church, shine the light of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Now when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Three of you know that song. Uh, <laughs> amen though, right? What a day of rejoicing that will be. But we're not there yet, are we? You ever just wish he'd just kind of whip us on up there and get it over with, get us up there quickly? But where has the Lord God planted his church? Where has the Lord God planted you? He plants us here. In a broken world, a broken culture, a broken nation. So what place then does the embassy of Jesus hold in this fallen land? The place of the church is to distribute kingdom values in current culture. We answered the who, this is the why and the where. The place of the church is to distribute kingdom values in current culture. My wife, Lindsay, is a surgeon, and uh, I happen to think she is amazing. And she has spent time as a surgical missionary in places like Peru, Zambia, and Haiti, and, and in the OR, there's no difference between a shepherd in the Andes Mountains or any one of us undergoing surgery. So more often than not, the most challenging part of this kind of work, of this kind of mission work, is, is developing trust and building relationships in order to effectively distribute the medical help that these people need. You see, many of these places have cultures where they, they take their physical needs to a witch doctor or, or a shaman or, or some sort of medicine man. And it can be frustrating because the medical team, they, they have the cure to many of their ailments. They've got it. But the culture is not always ready to accept it. This is the same for us. This is the same for the church, and we shouldn't be surprised by it either, folks. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. So we can rail and we can complain about our worldly culture or the, or the idolatry of money or sex or simply ourselves that we see all around us, but church... None of this should surprise us. It is our role as the church to distribute kingdom values in our culture. Just a few of them. Grace, instead of cancel culture, this, this idea that your bad act should be a stain on you forever. The cross says differently. Ephesians 2 says that God who is rich in mercy has made us alive in Christ. Even though we were dead in our trespasses, we are saved by grace. Your sins don't have to be a stain forever. That's a kingdom value. And as, and as kingdom reflectors, we are to value all people rejecting racism or sexism of, of any form. These are kingdom values, not worldly values. These are kingdom values. Galatians 3.28 says, there's no Jew or Greek or slave or free or male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. These are kingdom values. And just a few, just a few examples. The place of the church, the place of us, is to distribute kingdom values in current culture. And a word of caution. Jesus reflects himself through his church, not through politics. Yes, we're reminded throughout Scripture to submit to rulers and authorities. And yes, it is more complicated than that, I know. But we as the church will always answer to a higher calling than any political party this world will ever devise. It's the reason why I love the, the, the work of Compass Women's Center, which, which we heard about earlier today, and how they distribute kingdom values through love and care of women and men in the most difficult of circumstances. This is spreading the gospel. This is sharing the love of Jesus. Praise God for that. Praise God for his church. We must remember the church's rightful owner, and we must remember the church's rightful place in this world to, to be the Rukon mirrors 
reflecting the sun where there is shadow to reflect the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So back to our text as we near the end of our time together this morning. What is all this keys to the kingdom stuff? Well, Jesus says to Peter, and later in Matthew 18, he says it to to, to all his disciples. So we know this is not just a message for Peter. He says in verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Let's have one last bit of congregational participation. We'll, we'll, We'll get into the terminology in a second, but in a very, very loose way, it means this. What's the sl- what, what is the slogan you immediately said in your mind? Just do it. Jesus is saying, I'm spelling out for you the foundational principles of my church. So now just go and do it. Let's try it this way. The end of our text today is encouraging us to remember to live with confidence to reawaken to the church's rightful owner, to reawaken to the church's rightful place in this world, and then to live with confidence. So, keys of the kingdom. This is not too hard to figure out. We can do this. Let's read what it says, and then we'll put it in the context of the passage, right? A key does what? It opens something. Uh, a key opens something. And these keys that Jesus is giving will open what? The kingdom of heaven. Congratulations, you all win a trip to Miami. Um, think about that. Do, he, he's given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven, to open the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. Do, do you know the feeling when, when, when you're holding the keys to a new car? Or, that, or, 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 or uh, keys to, to your new apartment or a new home. That can be pretty exhilarating, actually. Can it be? It's exciting. Well, here Jesus is giving us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty amazing. Now, we know, of course, Jesus is not giving us a, a physical set of keys. As far as we know, there's not a handy key fob that goes kuk, kuk, and opens the keys of heaven, right? <laughs> but uh, but so, so what then are we to understand? Are these keys? Again, not hard if we read the context of what came before it. Super important when you're reading your Bibles. Jesus has just laid out this profound knowledge that yes, he is, as the angel told to Mary, Emmanuel, God with us, and that this knowledge is the Petra, the bedrock, the immovable rock upon which the church of God here on earth is founded. Those are the keys, my friend, that's it. Those are the keys. Are you skittish about sharing your faith with a friend or a family member? Don't be. Not quite sure what to say? Don't be. He gave it to us. Jesus is the son of God. Sent to earth to die on a cross for my sins and for yours. He rose from the dead and rules with the father in heaven and will one day come again to claim his people who have placed their trust in him as Lord of all. And hallelujah, I'm one of them. Don't you want to be too? Don't be afraid. John Piper puts it like this. When any faithful Christian who speaks the words with the bedrock of Jesus' identity at the center, when you speak those words faithfully, you are using the keys of the kingdom to open the kingdom in people's lives. Remember to live with confidence. You have been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So, now what? Without question, everyone in this room is on a different path and a different stage in their spiritual journey. But my prayer is that we're all headed in the same direction. Now what? Three ways to respond. Number one, acknowledge Jesus as Lord. You're a sinner, so am I. 
And maybe you're here and you've yet to completely repent of your sin and fall at the foot of the cross and accept God's gracious gift of forgiveness and make Jesus Lord of your life. If that's you, I hope you'll do that today or find a place on the card to let us know it's on your heart. We would love to talk to you about it. Acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Number two, reflect the kingdom in your sphere of influence. If we agree that the church is more than Sunday morning, how is your ambassadorship going? How is your ambassadorship going? Being an ambassador for Christ in this world will mean tension with the world, not comfort. Are you even recognizing the difference between God's kingdom and this kingdom? Meaning, if, if your biggest struggles in life are securing a financial, a, a, if your biggest struggles in this life are securing a stable financial future or, or, or losing 10 pounds or, or dealing with a boss who's a bum or being sad that you don't see your grandkids enough, you may not really be reflecting God's kingdom but rather just wandering in the shadows. Live in the tension between heaven's kingdom and earth and find a way to reflect the kingdom in your sphere of influence. And number three, live courageously for the gospel. Live in the confidence that Jesus himself says you should. He has given you the keys to the kingdom with the supernatural knowledge that he is Lord and has given you the authority to speak his name, his life-giving truth with everybody. Jesus tells us in the gospel of John chapter 16, verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I've conquered this world. Brother, sister, live courageously for the gospel. There is no better life in this world than one fully surrendered to Jesus. And together, we are the church. We are his church. Praise God for his church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for making it so clear Our mission here is your people on earth. May we base our lives both individually and collectively on this, on this Petra, this, this knowledge that you are the, that you are one with the almighty creator God of the universe who, who loves us and offers strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow through Jesus Christ. Help us, God, help us to live with boldness for the sake of this good, good, news. This we pray together as your church in your name. Amen.